Okay, welcome back to my channel, Made Between the Pages. My name is Taylor, and today we are back with another very, very exciting episode of Page Chewing with author Fonda Lee. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, I am a fan. <laughs> I scream about the Greenbone Saga all the time, so I am just so excited, delighted to uh, have you with us today. Also, I have my wonderful co-hosts, uh, P.L. Stewart and Steve Talks Books. Uh, the three of us are almost always together, so those of you watching probably <laughs> already know them. <laughs> but if you wouldn't mind uh, just giving us a little bit of a self-introduction about uh, where you started your journey or where you how you found yourself with us today on page doing and kind of what you do in the book space. Sure. I'm Fonda Lee. I'm a novelist of science fiction and fantasy. I'm probably best well known for that set of books that is behind Taylor on the screen, The Greenbone Saga. She starts with Jade City and then um, goes into Jade War, concludes with Jade Legacy, and has been described as um, a modern, epic fantasy, Asia-inspired, uh, ma martial arts gangster family saga. I never, never get those words out in the same order twice. Um, I am also the author of a number of science fiction novels, uh, Zero Boxer, Exo, and Crossfire. And I have a new novella out um, this week. It came out a couple of days ago called Untethered Sky. Yes, I just read that whole thing yesterday. <laughs> so in one sitting. <laughs> So <laughs> much shorter um, than Jade Legacy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Easier to to read in one setting. We just have a couple people in the chat. I want to make sure I get up. Uh, everyone's very excited. Uh, Maria's here. You, Got Maria. the chance to meet Fonda recently. She was beyond lovely. Mm -hmm. Philip Chase is here. Hi, Hooray, this is very exciting. Chad. Hey, Fonda and Ever Everton. I'm glad. I'm excited for this one. Greenbone Saga is my favorite trilogy. Oh, yes. Thank yes. You. We love having other fans. In the chat, Bo is also here. Evening, everyone. Tori, uh, as well as um, Fantasy Book Addict, Sophia. So thank you, everyone, for coming at, uh, by in the chat. So I wanted to start kind of with a macro scale, because as you've mentioned, you've kind of done things in different genres throughout your career. Uh, the Greenbone Saga is the one that I think most people are aware of and really uh, shot to, I would say, fame, <laughs> personally. But you have done a lot of other work in your career. And sci-fi seems to be kind of a, a linchpin point there in, in your works, especially since uh, they were your first, I think your first debut novel, Shadow Boxer, or uh, what was it? Unboxer? Zero Boxer. Yeah. Zero Boxer. There we go. Zero Boxer. That is a sci-fi as well. So I'm kind of curious, when you approach writing what most people would call urban fantasy and sci-fi, is there a different approach that you use or is it just kind of the same writing process for you and then they fall naturally into one of the genres? It really is more of the latter in that I don't feel as though I approach writing science fiction or fantasy really differently. Um, some of the ideas that come to me are naturally fantasy ideas and others are science fiction ideas. And I really do think of them just as two sides of the same coin. Um, there's always some speculative conceit and uh, how I wrap that around the characters and the narrative is uh, the fun challenge for me. Um, and so whether or not it's magic or high tech, whether it's a secondary world or far future, I really do just sort of approach them very similarly. And I think part of this is made easier by the fact that my fantasy is pretty grounded. So I, I, even hmm. the Greenbone Saga is, even though there is um, a speculative element of the magic jade, it's treated in a very, I suppose, realistic way in the sense that it, it I want it to feel unmagical, if that makes sense. I'm writing a, a fantasy story that I want to feel non-magical. Um, and you'll notice the characters in the Greenbone Saga never even really refer to Jade as magic because for them, it's just an ordinary part of their world and their day-to-day -day life. Um, so I think that makes it just very natural for me to bounce between science fiction and fantasy um, because it, with whether it's tech or whether it's magic, I'm always just trying to make it seem like a part of the characters' lives. That's incredible, because that was exactly the point that I was going to make, is that in the Greenbone Saga, I hesitate to call Jade a 
magic system, Mm -hmm. (laughs) personally. Uh, I find it, it's almost like a commodity in the world that happens to have properties that are useful. (laughs) And I am not so learned in sci-fi as to say this with too much confidence, but my understanding is that in sci-fi, usually people like to extrapolate how something in that world will affect the rest of the world. Whereas Mm -hmm. in fantasy, it's kind of taken as, Um, taken for granted as part of the world building, sci-fi says, okay, if this existed, what would happen? And that seems to be very much the case in your in your work. Yeah, I I absolutely love going down that intellectual exercise of there's some this is a, a speculative conceit. And now what are all the ripple effects? And how would that affect how people live and how cultures develop and how economics um, occurs in this world. And you'll notice I, I do that with the Green Bone Saga. Jade has um, implications for religion and the military and government um, and sports and uh, entertainment, everything. Um, and I think that is a, um, it, it is something that science fiction likes to do very often is take that one idea and extrapolate on how it affects society. And it often is something that is very timely or pertinent, whether that's AI um, or deep fake technology or surveillance or whatever it is. Um, And because I set the Greenbone Saga in a modern era and spanned a large amount of time, I could kind of do some of that, um, that exploration that you see in science fiction in the context of a fantasy world. Mm-hmm. When you are exploring those themes that are timely, is there ever a concern to be too close to reality or do you try to leave a buffer there between reality and your story? You know, I don't really um, feel as though that was a concern in my case mm-hmm. because I wasn't working in that uh, danger zone of near future. <laughs> I think that is, that's where oftentimes you writers will have the situation where, you know, do they end up dating themselves because they're butting up against what is happening in the real world. Because the Greenbone Saga is set in what I guess I would call our near past or an analog of late 20th century. So many of the things that happen in that saga are very, um, very analogous to things that happen in our own world, including Cold War politics, modernization, globalization, um, diaspora cultures, all of this stuff that is that should feel very recognizable to us um, happens in, in the Greenbone saga, but I never felt as though I needed to accurately reflect what happened in our world because this is still a secondary world. So I didn't need to go into things I didn't want to, like I don't have a space race in the Greenbone saga. <laughs> like there's not you know, a Bay of Pigs invasion. And so that hence I can kind of pick and choose the, the big themes that I want to tackle um, and, and pull them into my fantasy world without too much worry about butting up against, uh, you know, current day news. Hmm. Yeah, I find that uh, fantasy and sci-fi allow you to kind of have that reflective space. They allow you to have that distance where if you're dealing with a theme that might feel too close to home, if you use actual real world examples, if you're reading it in a world that is crafted in the way that you just mentioned, you can actually reflect on those things without it without your personal experiences making it too close to think about, if that makes sense. Um, So one of the themes that I noticed a lot in the Greenbone Saga, and I am not sure if it's in your other works, but I think I, there's a hint of it maybe in Untethered Sky, but talking about the idea of xenophobia and uh, nationalism and colonialism and how those themes in our world apply to our everyday lives. And each Mm. character has a different view on those things. And one of my favorite Mm. things that you did in the series is you were very well-rounded in the different ways that people can look at this. It's not, you should feel this way, or this is correct. It's based on that character's space in the world, they felt a certain way about those themes. And you were allowed to see that from many different perspectives. And as someone who does live abroad in a country that does have these issues, <laughs> uh, I, I will not fit in and never will. Um, it, it's a theme that really struck me. And I'm wondering in your writing, 
if it's this theme or, or other themes, if you purposefully put those in there or if they naturally kind of just flow from your life experience? That's such a good question because I think it's both. <laughs> Thank you. It's absolutely oh. both. Um, I think what happens is as, as writers, we set out just to tell a story and we have cool characters and, uh, and a, a fun premise and, and vibes and, you know, plot points. And we're just, we're just trying to tell a cool story, but in the process of doing so, we're unearthing all this stuff um, about ourselves because you can't write anything without putting yourself in, in the story in some way. Um, so what happens is you write a bunch of books and then you look back and you realize, oh gosh, these themes do keep coming up over and over again. And you had mentioned, um, I, things, uh, themes in the Greenbone saga, including diaspora culture and colonialism. And um, those absolutely show up um, for anyone who is, who has read EXO and Crossfire. That's a huge theme there. It shows up to some extent in Zero Boxer as well. It's probably most lightly touched in Untethered Sky, which um, is, it feels like its own separate thing. But yeah, absolutely. Um, there are sort of certain things that I keep coming back to, um, you know, dysfunctional families is another one they keep coming up and and, and so um they do come i think for me uh, from um this place of being uh you know a second generation asian american and my parents were immigrants and you know growing up um in, in north america not speaking the language of my parents and so you know i i wanted to represent um a diaspora culture uh, in, in the Greenbone saga, because it was something that I did not see in fantasy very often. Oftentimes, fantasy has these settings that feel very ancient and timeless, and there's this, these people who have been there for thousands of years and a lineage of kings and bloodlines and, you know, all the traditional fantasy tropes. And I didn't see in fantasy, you know, my own personal experience of um, people moving and and cultures blending and trying to fit in between cultures and you know the things that that resonated with me um so i i think absolutely my personal um perspective goes into these stories but also i don't um i don't have a heavy hand as a as a writer um i i think it's safe to say that i i tend to write with with restraint when it comes to what i want the the readers to take away and one of the beauties of having this big saga with multiple point of view characters is that I could show all those different perspectives. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. A character like Shay, who's gone and lived abroad and comes back to KCON has a different view of the world than someone like Hilo, who is so embedded in, in you know, the mother culture versus someone like Andin who goes away and, and is basically an immigrant in another culture or another country for some time. Um, and, and so I just want, I don't want to really tell readers my experience. I just want to paint um, these characters as authentically as possible and, and kind of make them, their experience feel real to the extent that I can. And some of that is fed in from my own experience. My baby Shay. <laughs> if, you can't, if you can't tell from the life experience I just shared, I connected with her on a visceral level <laughs> in the first book. I was like, oh, it me. <laughs> just, just opposite. <laughs> so I would say that you definitely achieved that, that realistic, it comes through, that it comes from life experience, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, we had just a couple comments based on uh, what we were talking about, Philip Chase, is very true about recognizable themes in Greenbone. They're a very natural part of the story, seamlessly woven in. Thank um, you. Philip Chase, actually, I was over on his channel to talk about Jade City a couple, the last week, I think. Uh, so mm -hmm. he has uh, is going to read Jade War next and hoping to have a conversation about that uh, when he gets there. But we did oh, have okay, a no spoilers. I'll know that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll try to keep it a little bit spoiler free, <laughs> but um, light ones are fine, I think. But uh, Philip is also an author himself, so I'm sure he knows that feeling. And PL as well. Uh, do you find that the themes show up naturally for you too, PL, when you're writing? Like you almost surprise yourself with what comes out? Um, you know, yes, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, I, I think I'm um... I might be a bit more heavy-handed, uh, more more purposeful, just in in my writing. But 
I do try to make a lot of themes uh, flow uh, naturally. Um, when it comes to um, the Green Bowl saga, and I haven't had the, the pleasure of reading all three books yet, I read uh, the first one. It was fantastic. Um, I'm so grateful to Taylor, especially for uh, getting me onto the the series. And of course, I'd heard so much about it in the community, uh, so much praise and well, well, well deserving the accolades. Oh, thank you. Um, the the one theme that I found um, really, really, there were so many things that were compelling, but I love this. What you did, uh, Fonda, with the um, like this complicated legacy of 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 the clan's inception. They were split, they were the liberators, the resistance fighters, and then they you know they 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 actually restrict crime to a certain degree, and they have these outward. Um, some of it, of course, you know, is self serving, but even genuine philanthropic efforts. There, you know, and that's combined with a code of honor and this, you know, and it it, it convolutes this perception of. Of, of their actions being savage and, you know, forced dominance, right? Um, you know, and you you don't let us forget that these are, you know, essentially bloodthirsty regimes that, regimes that you know, in some cases, you know, they, I mean, they prey upon the weak, they manipulate, they blackmail, they name, they kill, they do lots of these bad things in the name of self-preservation of profits. But um, even though it's cold-blooded and callous and, and violence is like the methodology, they still have this, this other side and I think that's obviously exemplified with with Lamb, and and I think the one thing that really struck me in terms of a theme uh, for me, and I'm not sure how purposeful this was, but for me it was: can you have members of this this criminal entity engaging in these violent activities? And and this is these organizations are by their nature they're they're abhorrent, they're ruthless, they're predatory, they're motivated by power and greed. But can they also be good? and or noble and can they can they do good or noble things and i found that absolutely fascinating the way you you portrayed that and so well done um you know so that was one thing for me that really really stuck with me in reading uh jade city and i'm sure will carry forward i'm guessing in in the the other books i i think that's safe to say yes <laughs> that you'll they'll get more of that and 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 more nuances to to chew on um, it was it was definitely something um, that I had the freedom to do because I was working within this secondary world context. Like if I had written a story about mobsters in our world, right, it would be much more black and white because in our world, you know, we all know the mafia is not a good organization. And it, I mean, even though we do love movies like The Godfather and and shows like The Sopranos, at the end of the day, you know, we know that these guys are criminals and that they're most likely going to end up behind bars. Um, but I didn't want to write a story that was um, cops versus robbers. And mm -hmm. even though I draw so much inspiration from the crime drama genre in writing these books, I also wanted to blend it with all the fantasy, um, epic fantasy elements, which included include things like, um, you know, the clash between noble houses and um, countries, you know, uh, kingdoms um, in, in conflict. And so I could create, I, I basically created a world where the, the culture and sort of the, some of the, the tropes and rituals that we associate with the mafia could be baked into basically the way, way this society works. And in order for it to be a fully functioning society, these clans can't just be unequivocally bad. They, they run the country. And so they've, they have created um, you know, a, a functioning society. Uh, and, and so they have so many of the functions of government. Um, and, and that thus it, pla it places them very squarely in this um, somewhat conflicted moral space for the reader, right? Uh, and and I'm, always, I'm always delighted to sort of see people try to wrestle with that because the world and the story takes place in a moral framework that's different from ours. Lots of I know there are lots of debates out there on you know certain actions that Hilo takes and whether they're justified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but so well done. I, he he didn't make it past Jade War for me, <laughs> but <laughs> I know many people who feel differently. <laughs> He's actually one of my favorite characters, uh, Hilo. I think because he is so um, like he's so gregarious. He's he's naturally. Um, you know, he's someone who big heart wears his heart in his sleeve. 
you know, cares a lot. Um, you know, is is he's so he's like so many people I've met, friends of mine, family members. You know, they 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 love hard and they 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 get angry, but they forgive. It's over, and you know, they 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 kind of um, they don't carry grudges. Obviously, it's different context where we're talking about grudges when it, in terms of 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 the gang, but but nominally he's not one to hold a grudge. He's looking to move look past that and move on in terms of his personal relationships with his family, right? Especially Shay. Um, you know, because of what he he holds against, what he what he believes that she did wrong. So I, I, I love that that him as a character because I feel actually he's 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 somewhat well rounded, right? He doesn't have, you know, uh lands necessarily um, you know, his, you know, Lance really cerebral and a thinker and and he's also outwardly very noble, right? And he 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 wants to be a good leader. He optically wants to be a good leader. I'm not saying that that Hilo doesn't, but but Lance's style of leadership is 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 uh, not only pragmatic, but but I think he 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 does it with uh, a lot of heart and a lot of compassion, which is, you know, uh, you think about an organized crime boss, you don't think about compassion. Those that isn't a word you normally associate with them. So, but yeah, again, characters exceptionally well done. Sorry, I went off a bit Thank of a tangent you. there, but <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm just I laughed in the middle of it because this comment Hilo is always justified because <laughs> Sophia and I have debated this since <laughs> time immemorial <laughs> whether he's justified or not. Which is the sign of a fantastic character, as PL said. Uh, even if I'm not the Hilo simp that a lot of people are, <laughs> I still very much understand why people like him because he's just fantastically crafted. Um, there were a couple other comments here from Maria. Couldn't agree more, PL. The honor code within that complex morality was so fascinating. Yes, I. this was something that struck me from the very beginning the idea of honor and saving face uh you know you it's very clearly um it's present in the book and you've mentioned many times that it's an asian-based fantasy but it's not one specific asian culture mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a blend of a bunch but as someone who's lived in japan for a while i recognized some things reflected from this culture as well and the idea of saving face and what's not said being almost more important than what is said is something I find so much joy in seeing done so well on page because I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because I had to learn that from the ground up as an American. I'm like, I say a, because I mean mm -hmm. a, and uh, it was a big culture shock when I came here and everyone means a, but they say B and I'm supposed mm -hmm. to infer a <laughs> from that. Uh, so I, I just want to say that, that that came through the pages as well, that kind of honor code. Oh, good. Yeah, no, that's that's very much what I wanted to do was to really paint the picture of a culture that is um, that's recognizable, but also feels very much like its own thing because it's been built around the this, this speculative element. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, though, there are touch points that are very clearly East Asian um, that, you know, East Asian cultures do have in common. And so that was part of my job was to make those touch points clear and then to also infuse them with novelty and, and different things that make KCON stand out from the countries that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. the, the code of honor definitely um, struck me and as well. And what struck me is how that manifested in terms of um, the duels, the, the, the duels between which I thought were, they were just uh, incredible. That's where, you know, uh, you know, I understand that you have a background in in martial arts, Fonda. That certainly played out on on the pages. Those 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 scenes were incredible. They were so well done, really thrilling. Uh, but but what struck me was that because of this these 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 the honor codes and how they were how things how things were parsed in terms of who you could rightfully kill if you were a jade and who you couldn't. But but in particular, how um, the leaders were expected to. Uh, show their prowess and and participate in these duels. It wasn't just their sending henchmen to, you know, like the leaders themselves, you know, were obligated to, you know, show their, it wasn't just about, you know, showing their might as a leader and their, you know, their, their showing their prowess and showing that they were fit 
waited to lead because they could defeat. So Wadu was about it was disarming that they're taking it on themselves. They're they're fighting against other leaders, and that was that was I thought was was really fascinating and and really well done because you know um, you think about a criminal organization where you know because you think of the mafia you know and in my mind you know a lot of these organizations lack honor mm -hmm. but when you, and, and and the the bosses when they get to a certain level of organization aren't ones that will put themselves in harm's way to the same degree that they would when they were this lieutenant but these leaders they're willing to put their lives on the line um you know it, it you know in terms of preserving the the clan's honor etc so i thought that was that was that was phenomenal Thank you. I mean, one reason narratively is definitely just because I wanted all my main characters to be badasses and to have really cool <laughs> fight scenes. So you know, there's that justification as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it it yeah, stuck yeah. out to me. They stuck out to me as well. I think that's a really good point that PL made in, in a different way that fantasy, than fantasy usually does, because usually it's the epic scale. It's the, the dramatic feeling of the moment that a lot of fantasy writers emphasize, and rightfully so, you know, you can see John Gwynn behind me doesn't get mm -hmm. more dramatic than Goliath gods. But what I found so intriguing about the type of fighting that you write is it's short and it's mm -hmm. quick because that's what it actually is. You know, mm -hmm. there's not 15 strikes to the face and then someone finally falls over. It's one good strike can take someone out. And uh, there's a particular scene where we get to see um, some of our main characters in action, I'll leave it that way, uh, finally see them in action. And it struck me because you didn't see this brutality exist in this character before. And then suddenly it comes out when it has to. So I think PL made a very good point in when you see these characters actually take action and participate in the violence, it's very realistic. Well, the, uh, that's good to hear because um, you're right, this isn't an epic fantasy that has big battle scenes, right? It's, it is a very um, street fight heavy um, story in that when the fights do happen, um, they, they hopefully do feel very, um, just very sudden, but also inevitable, right? Like that's kind of how I wanted to feel like, oh, of course it would spill over into violence. Um, but then when the, but I also want the violence to, to feel like how it would actually happen if, mm. you know, if two gangs had a confrontation in the middle of the street and, you know, you can imagine civilians and, and bystanders potentially, you know, being involved and, and um, property being damaged and, um, you know, things happening very quickly and very brutally. Yeah, and it's also very personal and always raises the stakes because when the leader is in the duel or the leader is the subject of, you know, an attempted assassination or something, like it raises the stakes because these are the people at the top of the organization and the clan could potentially fall if the leader is taken out, right? Or if nothing else, it will be disruptive to the clan and, you know, you have to attain new leadership, etc. So I thought that the it was so personal, you know, and because when it's the main characters involved, you're now you're really on the edge of your seat because it's people you've probably started to care about and care what happens to them, right? If it's some lieutenant that you don't care as much, okay, but now it's really personal, which which I, I absolutely loved, which I thought was was just um, phenomenal. But it it also um, I felt that because you know it reminded me, and I'm, I'm I'm guessing that was your your aim, you know, it it brought me back to not only um, you know gangster type movies like more American type and and, and Asian type gangster movies, but but also um, you know specific things like kung fu movies and 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 you know these 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 you know this these you know one on one you know fights where you know like everything is on the line and just yeah it was just the, and the tension was just ratcheted up you know so much I I I yeah I love that I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely hit um, on one of the big inspirations is like <laughs> Kung Fu flicks and, and yeah. Wuxia um, movies. Yeah, def absolutely. And I, I kind of wanted to take that sensibility, but then put it into, into this modern urban mm -hmm. setting. It, I mean, I know that you can't say much, but I, I saw in a recent interview, you mentioned there, 
the previous Peacock adaptation is not in the works, but there might be something else. And I, it would, this would go so well on screen if this comes through. <laughs> Your lips you can't to Hollywood's anything. ears, Taylor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I scream enough about it. We'll see if my little voice can reach them. <laughs> uh, before we move away from, from Hilo in general, I just had a couple comments about him. Uh, those decisions always felt 100% true to his values for me. So I loved him for that. Um, and I 100% agree with this. The consistency is absolutely there. Um, Hilo's amazing, but makes some brutal choices. Yes, Andrew. Yes. <laughs> uh, Hilo's loyalty is admirable, but I'd hate to be on his bad side. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would. I would not want to be there either. <laughs> Uh, then we did have a question here, which uh, is what I find interesting is the dichotomy between Jade representing virtue while mm -hmm. also representing power, which I guess you can apply as non-virtuous in many cases. Uh, was that intentional? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Jade in this story can be more of a stand in for a lot of things in our world, um, you know, whether that's uh, especially I'd say like money, you know, it could be uh, oil, diamonds, precious gems, right? It, it is a stand-in for things that people value, um, but that in excess could corrupt. And I think that's made very uh, tangibly clear by the itches, right? which is this disease that I invented. It's what happens when you overdose on jade, essentially have, uh, get exposed to too much of it. Um, and it is, uh, I, I, and I think that um, virtue uh, and power um, that that combination uh, is is just something that feels very I guess, real and realistic um, because you know so many things in in our world you know, you, you see them being um, being considered signs of either virtue or accomplishment, but that can become corrupting or toxic right at a certain point as well right like we we value money right there's nothing wrong with working for your, a living and wanting to make money and become wealthy but then we also see what, um, uh, you know, how much power accumulates with those who can contr who control money and, and are super wealthy. Um, and, you know, you see that as well with something like, uh, like political power, right? There's, there's virtue in wanting to be a civil servant and wanting to get into politics and be an activist and make life better for citizens. But then you see politicians rise to a certain level where, where that power is corrupting. Um, so yeah, absolutely, right? I, I wanted Jade to be this thing that's really revered by the society because it, um, was, uh, it, it was not only unique and special to them, but was also um, something very valuable culturally and just, um, just societally because it kept their country um, free and independent. And the fact that Jade is the reason why this little country um, is able to repel outside invasion makes it something that is very, very revered and, and, and um, important. But also when you have people who are who now, um, you know, associate it with uh, with with being worthy, being, um, you know, a strong leader, um, being green, right? That's the term that's used in world is there's such, a, such an incredible amount of emphasis uh, and pressure to be green, you know, that also becomes corrupting and, and, mm -hmm. and toxic. Uh, so I want to, I, I was always just trying to kind of show both sides in that. Yeah, this is, this is, a, this is Jade has, is good. Jade is bad. Jade is good. Jade is bad. I think that plays very well into what we previously mentioned is that there are many, or as you mentioned just now, that there are many things in life that are that, and very few things are just good or just bad. <laughs> uh, but something that you just mentioned, which I really did want to bring up, make sure I had the chance to, to pick your brain about <laughs> while we were here, is your characters are one of the main things that are praised and rightfully so, because I think we've talked about them for about 30 minutes with no problem because they're that complex. But something for me, because I just recently reread Jade City and something for me that stuck out that I, I don't hear enough people talk about is the politics in your book. And there's a lot of it. It's detailed. The foreshadowing is just 
fantastic <laughs> when you read the series as a whole. So I know that those threads can be, or I imagine that those threads are very complicated to weave and to weave them slowly and meticulously. So is politics something that you, it's kind of similar to my previous question that you consciously want to explore or does that naturally come from writing a crime family, as you mentioned, that is involved in politics, therefore it must be discussed. You know, it, is, it, yeah. is it naturally occurring or? I think it's naturally occurring just because of the premise of the story. I mean, even the way that I structured the clan with um, it having a military side under the horn and then a business side under the weatherman, um, set it up so that both would have to always be present and they would always have to be interacting. Right? So like failure of diplomacy leads to the military side of the clan getting involved, but often it's the business side of the clan that also that is also um, either reaping uh, the victories from the military side or having to cover up its defeats. Um, and and I, that uh, the fact that that is um, is just sort of in the baked into the nature of the clan and the and the main characters meant that there was always going to be a significant amount of politics. And I don't think I went into it being like, you know what I want to write in the series. I want to write like a ton of boardroom scenes. <laughs> like that's sort of how it turned out because, um, you know, I, I just knew like it, these clans, yes, they have Jade and they have superpowers, but like they also run the economy of this country in many ways and they're trading with outside powers and they're dealing with black market players so um the political and economic side of the clan's workings would be just as intrinsic to it um as the violence and i mean that's not anything different than in our world um you know whether it's governments or whether it's a or whether it's like the actual mafia right? there's there's the the uh there's the actiony side of the story but then a lot of um a lot of development a lot of the big turning points happen through these discussions and through these backroom deals and uh you know through schemes um and and oftentimes those are the those are the scenes that set up the big action set pieces mm -hmm. um there's a scene in jade war that i won't spoil but there's a boardroom scene um between hilo and another um uh, or, or another leader uh, in another country and that's a it's a it was a pretty delicate scene for me to write because i had to sort of imply what happens in that scene in terms of like how the power dynamics are um are occurring there that then sets up there's the sort of violent situation that happens later yeah, that's that's incredible. I know for me, it it was really as well. Like, and because it was so well done, uh, in in uh, Jade City, which was the book that I read so far, um, I know that especially in my, in my line of work in law enforcement, you don't, you know, it's easy to forget that um, organized crime groups, um, their sphere of influence can rise far beyond the street mm -hmm. street level, you know, crime. And can have these huge geopolitical implications right. that that's that's not what we think about when we think about about street gangs, right? But then you know, it, in essence, you know, in 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 your world and the ones that you've created um, in in the Greenbolt saga, Fonda, like like as you said, like the 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 Jade Warriors control the economy. They're they're dealing with you know, you have one clan that's more isolationist, and their policies are more isolationist. You have one that's all about big trade. And then they they have this this personal onus or responsibility to control the jade, which is the you know the major you know it's it's a major commodity as well. Like and and then you have you know essentially the the and from what I I've only read the first book again, and there may be I'm not sure what happens later, but it's very much depicted that you know the nominal law enforcement the police they're kind of neutered, they're more or less just you know just just um, uh, window dressing the fact that they understand. Who really controls the streets, and they they kind of stick to writing parking tickets and and things like that, right? So, and meanwhile, it's it's actually the the actual law law you know um, is imposed by by the jade the jade warriors, right? You know the 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 general populace doesn't go to the police when they want redress for something that happens; they're going to their clan, right? So so you create this power structure 
it almost includes not only like the law enforcement that resides with the clan. It was it was it was amazing. So well done. But you know that that just that was to me somewhat analogous. And I and it took me a while to think about that. Yeah, but that's somewhat analogous to um, you know the real world where we have to factor, and we we forget about how big the influence of of these you know essentially multinational organizations or crime organizations, but but you know what how big their their influence and their scope. Mm-hmm. Uh, can go, but you clearly outlined that in 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 your book, and I thought it was really well done. Thank you. One of the fun things that I did after I wrote the Greenbone Saga was write a novella called The Jade Setter of John Loon that was a tie-in. So it's a prequel to the entire trilogy, but it has different main characters. And one of the things that um, made me want to write that and why I had fun writing it was because um, it's from the perspective of people who are very much not in that power structure of the clans. And so they do have to rely on the police and, you know, you, you get more of a view into well, how, um, how there's kind of these, these tiers in the society. And, um, and, and I think, you know, it, it was a, it was a fun step away from the main characters that I had had in the Greenbone Saga and a nice little outside perspective. I ate that novella up, (laughs) but (laughs) uh, that does bring up to me one perspective that I think is universally hated, but is necessary, which is Barrow. (laughs) Uh, So uh, he he strikes feelings in everyone that talks about him. Um, And one of my favorite ways to talk about him is my friend Tammy actually on uh, Twitter, I think it was a couple of years ago now, but you were asking who would you cast in, in an adaptation? And she said a cockroach for Barrow. And I was like, yes, that's perfection because he will not go away. <laughs> it, it'll be the end of days and he'll still be there, you know? <laughs> but I do think that he does hold a narrative place, which is really important because like you just mentioned with um, Jade Setter, we get so sucked into the microcosm of the lives of these people that we forget that there are the upper echelons of society and Barrow kind of shows the shows you the repercussions of the society that they uphold. This is what they are creating by holding this space. And um, as much as I agree with the casting of a cockroach, I do see that he's important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember um, once on Twitter, there was a, a thing going around of um, a picture book, but from a non-main character POV. And when I I pitched the series from Barrow's point of view, he can sound like the hero, right? Like in his mind, he yeah, he's he's trying to buck the system. He's just, he wants his share. He wants his piece. Um, I'm listening to a, mm-hmm. a fascinating uh, podcast called Up Against the Mob. And mm-hmm. it is, it's a, it's a podcast uh, by a uh, former Um, Southern District of New York prosecutor who's done tons of mob cases. And one of the things um, that is mentioned in that podcast and, you know, and and I'm sure has been uh, mentioned elsewhere is that like the, the, there's the mafia, but then there's kind of all these, the mafia, oftentimes the the gangsters are surrounded by these, by a whole bunch of hanger ons and wannabes. Mm. Right. So, um, you know, there's, there's this, this, um, the this glamour i guess this uh the the sort of seduction of that lifestyle that trickles down to a lot of 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 people who you know don't have who are probably low on the iq scale but kind of want to be want to be part of it they like they they you know um aspire to what they see as like the the the, this this power and this lifestyle um and i sort of think of barrow that way right like he is um, he, he's a wannabe. He, he wants he wants what he can't have, and what he sees as as being sort of the pinnacle of society that he that he can't reach. Um, and from that perspective, I have sympathy for him. I know, I, I, and I, I know that uh, you know he he plays a infuriating role in the narrative. Um, and I'm I was frequently uh, like writing him, I would get infuriated, but but. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, <laughs> I think you, as a writer, I have to have sympathy for him in order to write him. And I, I think some readers come around to that too, in the end. 
but but you also show us that um i don't know looking at the chat i'm not so sure oh. <laughs> <laughs> my, my apologies Fiona. no not at all but but you also show us that these lower level players can have a huge impact depending on you know um like without spoiling uh and again it's it's jt we're talking about here lower level player right if they're um cunning enough uh, right place right time circumstances uh, they can 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 affect you know things bigger you know a bigger of a bigger scope than just you know um, on their little tiny corner of 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 what they're trying to to do right so that's that's one thing that struck me about his character in particular that you know he gets involved in things that are far beyond the scope of what he should be and and has a big impact on on these things by by just basically one main action. And, you know, from there, you know, that that changes the whole course of, 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 you know, the series potentially. So it just shows you that, yeah, that little player can can have a big impact, you know, depending on 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 how things roll for them. So. Just wanted to show some of the Barrow comments. Hate Barrow with a passion. Um, I'm on the Barrow defense squad, my favorite cockroach antagonist. <laughs> And then we do have some sympathy here from Philip. <laughs> Poor Barrow, he's pitted against the system. Uh, and Barrow is also at least in part a product of the system. I will not argue that one. Yes. And we'll see, Andrew, if Fonda provides you with the horrible, torturous death that you so desire. <laughs> we'll see if she she grants your wish. <laughs> um, there was a... Uh, before we move on from Greenbone, because there are a couple other things that we want to be able to discuss, although we could talk about Greenbone for hours, there were just a couple of comments in the chat I wanted to make sure I put up. Uh, the first one was, I think you do a really good job of giving your characters distinct personalities and voices. How do you come up with them? What are your inspirations? That's so hard to answer. I don't really know. <laughs> I, I, you know, I started off writing the Greenbone Saga with a with very little idea of who the characters were. It came to me mostly as uh, just a, a concept of, of, and vibes, really. And I knew that I wanted um, it to be a family saga, um, but I didn't know who all the players were. So I spent some time basically developing a family that I felt would um, butt heads on multiple levels um, and would have a bunch of really distinct, interesting characters that could all be POV characters because they would all have, uh, there's no reason to have multi POV characters unless they each bring something different to the table. So all of these family members really did have to be very distinct in order to justify them being POV characters. But also, um, I really just kind of started with archetypes. So I had in my mind, okay, there's going to be a responsible eldest brother and then the you know, temperamental middle child and then the, you know, the spoiled youngest child, right? Like those are really very general um, outlines. And um, when I, then when I said, okay, well, that's a that's a starting point. It's it's very bland, and then I start filling in those characters and and um, what their backgrounds are, and and um, I have them interact with each other, and you know I really just kind of got to know them gradually, and um, you know I I had you know when I when I set up that Hilo and Shay were about the same age and that they clashed a lot and wrote them having interactions, then that would chisel away at their personality and, and reveal more of it to me every time those characters interacted with, with each other. Um, so uh, so I, I guess the, the, that's not really a, a really in-depth answer to how do you actually come up with characters other than you, it's sort of this constant interplay between what you know the plot direction is and who the characters are because they're constantly influencing each other and you just sort of have to keep writing and learning about the characters as you write and then you learn more about them so you revise and it goes back and forth like that um, but I I got to a point where they just I 
they just kind of were people to me. And so it actually made, even though Jade Legacy tactically was the hardest book to write because it was so big and there were so many moving pieces and it was spanned to such a long period of time. In one aspect, it was the easiest book to write. And that was in the characters. Because by the time I reached Jade Legacy, I just knew these characters incredibly well. And I knew how they would age and how they would evolve and change as they aged. Um, and so I could just, I could write a scene where Hilo and Shay have a conversation and it would, it would be really easy because I just knew how both of them talked and how they would respond to each other. Um, and, and yeah, I, char characters are, I, I, I really learned a lot about writing characters through, through the Greenbone Saga. I imagine so, since that's the core of it, right? <laughs> at the at its heart, really. Um, and then this was just a very interesting observation that I wanted to put up for food for thought. The idea that Jade and Greenbone has some things in common with the One Ring in Lord of the Rings mm. just occurred to me as you were speaking. But Jade is perhaps mm. more ambiguous. And mm. that had never occurred to me either. Um, and then Andrew says, the One Ring is secretly made of Jade and has gold plating. <laughs> Yeah, it's, in a way, I mean, I, I, that's a really interesting way of looking at it, um, because in another way, I do the opposite of the one ring, because the one ring is just one ring, like that's it, right? Um, and so everyone is trying to get it, and hence the like confluence of all these forces and, you know, the big battle scenes. Um, well, as Jade, I kind of took the idea of one ring, but then I was like, okay, but now it is a like entire industry, and it is you know, being mm. distributed and shipped around the world. And, and so it's now like the one ring, but like as a commodity, you know, uh, uh, like if you could take the one ring and cut it up into little itty bitty pieces and I don't know, manufacture it or synthesize it, then what would happen to Middle Earth? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the adaptation we need right there. <laughs> that, that's the elves, that the elves start a like one ring cart. Well, it wouldn't be one ring anymore. It would be cartel. Yeah, cartel. So the elves start like a ring cartel. Oh my they god! Control yes. The ring, and then then there's oh yeah. Then there's tension with the dwarf kingdom because they want in on the ring economy. No. Yeah. Uh, they can story, mine though. all of the all of the sources that the elves need. Oh, this is right. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I, I, I did, if it's okay, I know we were going to be away from the Greenbone saga, but you know, again, it was just captivating. I want to also, um, compliment you, Fonda, on what you did with the lore, the mythology, wrapping the religion up with, with the deities in like you know, with, with Jade, and it just was really fantastic. And I love your. I absolutely adore the chapters where um, you talked about the myths, like for example, you know how um, how Kikon was. Forgive me if I I'm not pronouncing it right. The island Kikon, yeah, Kekon, Kekon, yeah, Kekon, yeah. You know that that it was created from the mother goddess. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, falling to the ocean, and then and then after she made the world, and then her body was the island, and and the 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 veins of jade that were in the mountains were bones. Like I just like I, that, those were some of my favorite. Uh, you 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 you'd sprinkle these these chapters uh, in in the middle of the main action. It was just like it was just amazing how you revealed the world that way. I absolutely loved it. But but yeah, I just I just wondered, you know, what was some of the inspiration for for some of these mm. myths and and yeah. and and what made you choose to uh, expose the world building that way you expose in other ways, obviously. But I just love those. Those chapters where you can, you know, you, you gave us this tale, uh, yeah. this this legend. I, I just thought it was amazing. I really enjoyed writing the interludes because um, they served a few purposes for me. One was obviously you know, giving um, more of the lore of this world, uh, but the other was to punctuate the narrative. So the interludes always show up at specific points in the story that that um, they're, they're almost like. Um, I mean, they, they often hit like right at a, at a critical juncture. And so I, I've always wanted to find ways for the interludes to tie in thematically to what was happening in the narrative um, at that particular time. Um, so, you know, the, even the juxtaposition of some of the chapter titles of the interludes with what's going on in the main narrative, um, you know, tie together um, 
and and I I also use the interludes as a way to I to make KCON feel more like a present day society. Um, and, and in so far as, um, you know, I wanted really like this KCON to feel like a place that exists now, um, but that has this really long history and its own myth and its own culture and so on. Um, and so the interludes were a way for me to kind of, m to do that, to show KCON as, um, as having this, uh, this, this long, um, history with Jade and like the myths and how those myths like inform the current day culture. Um, so yeah, the, they, they were a lot of, of fun for me to write. Um, and, and I talked about how they punctuate the narrative. They also were a way for me to make the most use of omniscient POV, uh, omniscient author voice was I would have something really major happen and then yank you up to like a 10,000 foot level um, and, and, or create this sort of thematic remove or a sort of a almost a certain emotional distance from the story for a moment before kind of diving back in. That reminds me a lot of how some other fantasy authors use like sentient gods to pull you right. up to an omniscient level. It was kind of the same feeling. And then yes. they drop you back in with us, us mortals. So, <laughs> uh, I wanted to kind of go a little bit more on the macro scale of Greenbone with a question that Bo put in the chat way earlier, but I wanted to save it for now, which is when writing the series, did you always intend for it to be a trilogy? Also, was there ever a point while writing Jade Legacy where you thought about extending it to a fourth or maybe fifth book? I did not know it would be a trilogy when I started writing. I knew it would be hopefully more than one book but I didn't know for sure. So I had to write the first book in a vacuum of, of knowledge. Um, but uh, once it was um, picked up by my publisher and I had a, th a contract for three books, then I mapped it out as a trilogy because I, I, kn I knew there was enough material that I wanted to cover that could easily hit three books. Then when um, I was writing, the, I've, I've had this question a few times though, when you were writing the third, could, would you have broken it up? And I think it comes from the fact that a lot of time is covered in the third book. Um, and so if I'd wanted to fill more books, I could have broken it up into, in, into, a, into more pieces. But um, no, I was never tempted. I think part of it was because um, I just knew what I wanted the third book to be. And I, I sort of had a, a um, schematic in mind of, of how the, the trilogy scaffolded uh, the first book being um, the clan war and KCON, the second being really focused on sort of the international conflict and the third book really being about that intergenerational conflict that um, I would have ended up stretching that theme across multiple books. I don't think I would have, it would have maybe been fun to spend more time with the characters, but I, I definitely went in with an idea of what I wanted that third book to accomplish. And, also, I just had a whole bunch of other ideas I had to write. So now, no, I didn't, I didn't really get tempted to extend it into four or five books. Coming from someone who will purchase anything else in this world, I mean, the subterranean press already has my money, but I, I think that there's a, I think maybe more series, be it books or TVs or whatever, need to do that <laughs> because I think it, it, if you know where you're going and then you change it halfway through, sometimes that can show uh, in the in the story. And I think why Jade Legacy had the critical acclaim it did is because it was very intentional. It was a very intentional book and everything was wrapped up in a way that showed that it, it wasn't pandering in any way, shape or form. You know, you broke a lot of people with that book, myself included, but <laughs> but all of the endings had a point, had a purpose. And I think, you know, wrapping it up in that way for me personally as a reader was probably the best way to go. <laughs> so um, I'm not really surprised to hear that that you had that planned because I, I felt yeah, that way. Yeah, I, 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 um, I love fantasy, obviously, but I will admit I am a reluctant epic fantasy reader sometimes because I, I am, uh, I, I'm cautious of series that are unfinished and that I don't know when they're going to end and how much time is going to be between books. Uh, and so I didn't, I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to be on like the giving end of that, if you will. Like I also really love 
I love fantasy, but I also love stories that end. Um, and so <laughs> that was that was really important to me. Also remember, Jade Legacy was my pandemic book. So I was writing it in really majority of it was in 2020, which was, which was a trip. Uh, but I remember <laughs> writing Jade Legacy and, um, and this is gonna be, this was morbid, but I was really motivated by this thought of, you know, if God forbid I perish from this earth in a global pandemic, I am not leaving with an unfinished epic fantasy series. I'm like, I will, my soul will be at, <laughs> ill at rest. Uh, and so I was, I was just really motivated <laughs> when I was writing it. Just imagine you with like a flag with the Jade Legacy cover on it, like st stamping it in the ground. I was here, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> well, I, I, I feel that that's, that's one of the things that motivated me to start writing period. Start because, you know, you, you get to a certain age and I started writing very late publishing very late in life and it's like okay you have more years behind than ahead and what if I don't get to put any of these books out that are in yeah. my head so and that's what motivates me today to keep pumping out a book every year because you know I have a seven book series so you know I want to make sure at least that finishes yeah, you, gotta, you gotta work fast <laughs> yeah and I have a lot more yeah. books planned beyond that I have 30 books planned total at least that I want to write and you know that'll take me into my 70s so I have 80s so I I got to get going. So yeah, I, I feel that Fonda, when you said that, that sense of urgency, you know, mortality that, you know, I have to get on this. On the reader side, I imagine Steve and I also feel the, the pressure of we're never going to read that TBR. We're never, it's just, it's forever expanding. <laughs> yep. And uh, I, I feel that in a different way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But talking about, you know, leaving stories behind and, uh, you know, getting the your thoughts on paper, you have a brand new book out, which came out last week, uh, or that last week, a couple days ago. Two actually, days ago. Right? Sorry, my, my days are off because I'm a day ahead, but um, I purchased it right away, read Untethered Sky in one, one sitting. Um, I tour novellas, you know, <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> So I wanted to give you a chance to kind of tell people about this new work. Um, I don't want it to be overshadowed by, by Greenbone because it is, it is wonderful. So could you tell us a little, about, uh, a little bit about Untethered Sky? What can people expect? Sure. Yeah, yeah, Untethered Sky is um, a, what I've been calling a wildlife memoir with monsters. So it yeah. is um, really inspired by a childhood love of wilderness adventure and animal companionship stories. So um, you know, my side of the mountain and Julie of the wolves and uh, where the red fern grows and all those stories that make you cry at the end when the dog dies. Um, there's no dogs that die in Untethered Sky, unfortunately. Um, but I- Spoiler um, alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. But, uh, but I um, wrote Untethered Sky um, after Jade Legacy because I um, really want to stretch different creative muscles. I've written this big epic trilogy and I wanted to try my hand at writing something that was, that was short and tight and compact and very different from Greenbone Saga. Greenbone Saga is it's, it's urban and modern and gritty and, and um, Untethered Sky is ancient countryside. And, and um, you know, it, it takes place in a world that is, that is um, loosely inspired by ancient Persia. And it's more delicate and contemplative. It's a single POV um, story about a young woman named Esther who um, is training monsters. She trains rocks to hunt man-eating manticores. Uh, and um, it is, it, 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 it was definitely the sort of right project, right time for me. Um, and, and a way for me to just try something completely different, a story that I actually have had in my mind for a very long time, and finally found the, the outlet for it. Something that stuck out to me in the, in the book is it definitely has the animal companion piece that you mentioned, you know, it's kind of the core of the book, but something that stuck out to me as different is you really seem to emphasize the merciless, brutal mm -hmm. nature of the wild. It's not like telepathically, this is my best friend, you know, like it doesn't have those vibes at all, which a lot right. of fantasy companionships do have. Yeah. So I'm curious what inspired you to take that very, I'd not like 
the unique, I guess, is the best word I can mm -hmm. think of. A uh, stance that we usually don't see, a perspective we usually don't see yeah. in among companionship, which is very, well, I guess, grounded, just as you say, green bone is. But I'm wondering where that inspiration came from. Oh, I think it comes from two places. One is an, an actual real fascination with the sport of falconry. So I, um, you know, remember uh, being fascinated by um, birds of prey for, you know, quite a while. I've been on hawk walks and visited raptor centers. And um, I had a couple of master falconers um, beta read the manuscript. And so I was just kind of fascinated with the actual details of falconry, including, you know, all the little things like how the process of, of training a, a hawk to the hood um, and, uh, you know, Jess's and, and lure training and all those um, very tactical things. I imagined them, but like with a bird that was gigantic. Uh, so those little tangible details made it into, um, into the novella and make it feel more grounded, like you said. Um, but the other reason is honestly just because I think that is my MO now. Like I, I think I take speculative elements and fantasy and then make them very not magical. And, and in the sense that like, I want them to feel very normal. Uh, and so, yeah, you're right. There is no, there's no telepathic bond. You know, I, I, and I love all those stories. I remember reading you know, Dragon Riders of Pern and, um, you know, and, and like the Temeraire novels. I, I, I always, I enjoyed a lot of those books, but yeah, I, there's no kind of sweet, fuzzy animal sidekicks or telepathic soulmates, like nothing like that. <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, shoveling a lot of bird shit is like definitely part of Esther's experience. But then, you know, I, and I, I think I do, I, I have that tendency to, to do that. Like it, I'll, I'll look at fantasy elements or um, science fiction elements and then sort of think about the practical implications. Like, yeah, being telepathically bonded to a dragon would be amazing, but like, how much does a dragon eat? And like, just, you know, I mean, like how, I mean, how much trouble would it be to clean the crap out of your dragon's pen like every single day, you know, like changing the litter box is hard enough. <laughs> so those sorts of, I don't know, that's just sort of what I think about. And, and, and I have, I definitely know there are readers out there who are like, you know, Fonda Lee's magic always feels like very, like not magical or like not high, high, high fantasy, um, which is true. You know, I, I, there, I, my fantasy, I think, has been described as low fantasy, and I can kind of see that as well. It's, um, it, it sort of just becomes part of people's day-to-day -day life, and training a giant bird that could eat your face off um, would would be would be pretty difficult. Yes, my husband at one point said, "What do you think?" Because we we have some we have a, a snake and some not usual pets. He's like, what would you think about an owl? And I took, I Googled it for two minutes and said, absolutely oh, right. not. Right, right. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. they take so much time and effort. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I did so. a lot of research into falconry as part of writing the novella. And as much as I think it would be, I, I think it's the uh, super cool um, pastime, but the amount of, time and patience and investment that goes into it is not something that would ever work with my lifestyle. Yeah. Mm -mm. They need all your love. <laughs> and, uh, you know, same thing with a snake. Do they return it? Mm, you know, <laughs> my pretzel's very healthy, but I don't know if, if he could, he might try to eat me. He can't, but he might. <laughs> if he, if so. he was, if he was huge, if he was, like yeah, right. Ten times the size that he is now. Scale him up, right? <laughs> um, we have. I read Untethered Sky and felt betrayed by the end. <laughs> and uh, would you consider expanding upon this world? I really didn't intend to. Um, I conceived of it very much as a one and done. I feel like it's a. Um, it, it's sort of a a a, a little break in my um, my writing schedule insofar as I wrote this huge trilogy and then you know I wrote a novella and now I've got other big books planned. So um, you know I, I don't imagine that I, I'm going to expand on it and I, I do hope that it's this this thing that you can just consume and enjoy in, in a sitting or two. Hmm. Can confirm recently did that so <laughs> uh, but 
you know, the time always goes so incredibly fast. We're already over an hour here. We don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, but as Stephen PL know, I always try to slip this question in if I can <laughs> when it's on my channel. But um, in the same way that PL said he loves the mythology that you wrote in your book, I am also obsessed with those types of things. And that extends to knowing the histories and what makes people who they are uh, individually. So I like to ask our guests, is there a story from not necessarily your childhood, but a formative story, whether it be a video game, a movie, a TV show, a book that you think has helped kind of shape you into the writer or the reader that you are today in the way that you do ground things and, you know, the way that you hmm. approach stories. Is there something yeah. that you think influenced that in your life? Oh, my gosh. I know it's a big no, question. It is. And, you know, it's hard to pinpoint a particular work because um, it feels more like a whole body of work, you know, that I consumed early on in life would have informed it in a whole bunch of different ways. So like, it's hard for me to parse out like who influenced me more like Asimov or Bradbury or, um, you know, uh, was it Chronicles of Narnia or was it Prydane? Like, you know, so it's, it, there's a lot of stuff. Um, but I think one of, probably one of the most formative series for me was um, Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern. And mm. I think it hit me at a certain time in my life, I think it was in my teens, um, that it just made an impact. And, I, and for a few reasons, um, one, because she was a woman author who was creating these like big, expansive, complicated fantasy world, you know, while before I had read a lot of dude authors. Um, and then on top of that, uh, she did something that just really like clicked with me, which was she blended science fiction and fantasy. And, you know, the, the, the idea of these dragons, right, it starts off feeling very fantasy, but then it you, you learn the background of it, and it's very science fictional. And that was, I think, maybe the first book or series that I read that fit pretty squarely and kind of like this this um, fuzzy area between the genres and, and blended sci-fi and fantasy. And you'll, and I, I think that's something that I took away that I, that I do is I like to play in those spaces between genres. And Greenbone Saga is a good example of this, where it's, um, you know, blending of fantasy and crime drama and Kung Fu, but, you know, sort of the fantasy has also got a science fictional sort of tinge to it. And Untethered Sky is a mix of, fantasy but also like memoir and and wildlife adventure and so i i like i like that and i think that's partly something that i got from her books i've had them recommended to me many times so they are on my my ever expanding tbr haven't read them yet but have you no, guys I've read never them? read, I've never reread them. So I, okay. I read them pretty, yeah, like er, relatively early in my life. And I'm a scared to reread them. It's kind of one of those things. Like an, another book that I would say had a pretty formative effect on me was Wrinkle in Time, mm -hmm. which I loved when I was a child. But then when I tried to reread it with my own kids, it didn't hit the same. And so now I'm terrified to reread everything that I loved when I was young. Sometimes it's better when it's just like, the feeling of it and the, and the nostalgia. Yeah, I had the series, what was it? Calling on Dragons, Searching for Dragons. I reread that book tons when I was little and I reread it. The first book hit and then the rest didn't. And I was like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> the the rose tinted glasses, I've shattered them. <laughs> so I feel you on that. <laughs> uh, we just had one kind of not specifically book related question but uh Bo says hey Fonda is there any updates you can share with us on the Kraken Book Co replacement dust jackets was there a recall I, I on dust do jackets? not have any idea what's happening on that front honestly mm -hmm. I mean they contacted mm -hmm. me for the licensing rights um way back when um and so there was a there was a deal signed but um no I have not received any updates I'm sorry and I unfortunately don't have any um, you know, creative control or, or uh, involvement with, with, you know, on, on the merchandising side. 
Yeah, it's that's something we didn't really get to talk about today because time goes so quickly. But PL and Steve are both PL being an indie author and Steve being someone who reads a lot of indie. We often talk about the difference between traditional publishing and that type of contracting and and indie publishing and the the pros and cons of both. But it seems like some traditional publishing, um, there's more space between the author yeah. and the product than you would envision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's definitely, um, you know, you're you have. On, on one hand, it's a blessing and a curse, right? On, on one hand, you don't have to deal with all of the things that indie authors do have to think about all the time um, and get really deep in the weeds. But then on the other hand, you know, things go wrong and you don't have control over them at times. I, I tweeted, I think it was a week ago or so, a couple of weeks ago, um, that a recent run of Jade War had um, uh, about three Saw chapters that. missing. and. Yeah. An entire, like, 32-odd pages of an entire a book on the, the, I think it was called New World, the French Re History of the French Revolution. <laughs> Just, I can only imagine what it must be like as a reader to hit that. So, yeah, things, things like that. <laughs> I've never about seen anything like that before. <laughs> have heard about it. Yeah, I have the the matte cover of Jade City still because they did that weird release oh, where yes. they didn't where they didn't do the shiny one. Yeah, yeah. Like, and oh, that was again that was something that I found out about later and had to yep. send a whole bunch of emails to my publisher and and eventually get it get it sorted out. But yeah. yeah. Sorry about the mismatched covers. I know that bothers oh, me. Too. Yeah. It, of course it bothers me, but you don't have to apologize. I don't mind giving you more money for another copy later. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this was just a wonderful conversation. Uh, we really, really appreciate your time. Uh, before we go, though, I'd just like to give everyone on the screen, PL, Steve, and yourself, of course, a chance to kind of sign off, tell people, you know, where they can find you, what work they can expect. You mentioned a book that I know that you've teased on Twitter, some other larger books coming out, anything you'd like to mention uh, before we go. Maybe we could start with Fonda and then just sure. go. I can't point. You guys know that way. <laughs> Go ahead. I know what order we're on in the screen. Um, so I, um, you can find me online. My website's FondaLee.com. I'm on Instagram at Fonda.Lee, um, Twitter at Fonda J. Lee, and I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Fonda Lee. Um, I have a new book out, Unto the Sky, which we've talked about, so you can get that um, anywhere that books are sold. There will also be an audiobook edition of it that comes out soon. And I am working on more novels. Um, most um, currently is a science fiction duology uh, that has just recently been announced. Um, the first book being called The Last Contract of Isako. And uh, it will, you will have to wait a while. It will not be out until 2025. I have to finish writing it. Um, but I'm very excited about it. It, it, it is my um, cyberpunk samurai space opera. Nice. <laughs> Those are good buzzwords. <laughs> Steve, you want to take, take it away? Yeah, sure. Uh, before I do my, I just want to thank uh, Fonda again for spending, and we know you're very busy, so thanks for hanging out with us. We uh, we appreciate it. Um, for me, you can find me on Steve Talks Books or Steve Talks Movies on YouTube or at pagechewing.com. I'm easy. <laughs> yeah, you got your pitch down to an art. Yeah, enough <laughs> practice, yeah. <laughs> and P.O.? What about you, P.O.? Yeah. Yeah, I also want to say thank you so much, Fonda, for for joining us. One of the usually anticipated episode. Can't wait to get in to read the rest of uh, of uh, the Greenbone Saga. Hopefully, get into uh, the next book next month. And uh, yeah, uh, Peel Stewart. You can find me mostly on Twitter, my preferred social media platform at Peel Stewart Writes. Uh, the books uh, www.peelstewart.com, and of course, uh, page chewing beside my wonderful co-host. That's where you can find me in terms of the YouTube space for the most part. And uh, also before we go blog where I'm an assistant editor, you can find my reviews there and on Goodreads and, um, you know, including a review of Jade City, which is, uh, again, a phenomenal book that uh, that I loved and I can't wait to read uh, the rest of the series and more books from, from Fonda Lee, including uh, Untethered Sky. Congratulations on the new release. Thank Fonda. you. Thanks, P.L. Uh, if you are watching this, somehow don't know who I am. This is my channel. My name is Taylor. <laughs> uh, maybe, my channel's maybe between the pages. Uh, you can find me, just as PL and Steve said, uh, next to the two of them on page chewing on either my channel or Steve's channel or we're manifesting PL's channel 
we're manifesting it. We'll see in the future. Soon. Uh, <laughs> yes. You can also find me on Twitter. Uh, I do a lot of book interaction there. And on Before We Go blog, where I am also an assistant editor. Uh, but as everyone has said, and I also already said, I suppose, but thank you so much for joining <laughs> us, Fonda. <laughs> thank you, all three of you, and to everyone in the audience. Hmm. Uh, Maria says, thanks for a wonderful discussion. Yes, I second that. So thank you to everyone in the chat for joining us. It always really enriches the experience to have you guys dropping comments and questions. Um, feel free, if you're watching this afterwards, to drop a comment and you know, down below in the comment section and we will respond. Uh, but thank you everyone for being here and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. <laughs>